So I have right at seven, I went ahead and resumed our recording. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few more jumping on, but this is our second to last session of Gardening 101. There's a lot of familiar names on there. So I thank everybody for hanging in on the live versions. You get a lot more out of it that way. But today we have Arthur with Bailey's Gardens and he is going to be talking about landscaping with the warm weather. Um, I'm sure everybody's really itching to get out there and do some yard work and do some landscaping renovations. So Arthur's going to give us an overview on landscaping and just the housekeeping items, just as we've been covering for every session. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A box. There's also the chat function. If you're using the chat, uh, good morning, Deb. Uh, good evening, Deborah. I see she typed in the chat. Go ahead and change the two to all panelists and attendees. That makes sure everybody that's on the call can see it. And um, if there's discussion back and forth on things that people have used or have questions on, sometimes the other participants might be able to add their feedback then. Or if you use the Q&A, either way, um, if we don't get to it right away, we will get to it by the end of the sessions. Sometimes. Um, a question comes up that is covered later. So Arthur's gonna go through his presentation and then we'll have a period of questions at the very end. So I'll turn it over to Arthur, let him uh, go ahead and share his screen. I'll turn my video off, mute myself, and he'll get us started. One second, the computer is being a little slow. Right. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, it's coming through just fine. Melanie, are you raising your hand because you need to say something or because you can see it okay? See it, Emily? Yes, it's okay, coming just through. To make sure. All right, great. Well, I'm glad to be here uh, with everyone today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Arthur Ebling. I'm the CEO at Bailey's Gardens and Landscaping. We're a local uh, landscape company. We specialize in you know, landscapes, hardscapes, and water features. Uh, we've done work in you know, residential as well as commercial, uh, Starbucks and Benihana and Blaze Pizza and other uh, companies uh, like that. Um, I have a Background as a master gardener, actually, um, a little over a year ago, I, I did the uh, master gardener program through the WVU Extension Service, which I highly, highly recommend. Um, excellent program and uh, was something that really uh, was extremely useful to me and really inspired me to, to uh, continue with, with my career. Um, to give you a, sort of a, a quick background, um, I have a whole business background that I, I won't go into too much, but uh, I started the company about four years ago and um, had experience in other uh, businesses and so sort of brought some of those skills to bear uh, in landscaping. And I've been continuing my education quite a bit. So in, in addition to the WVU Extension Service, um, I've been doing a course uh, through the Royal Horticulture Society um, and their level three uh, certificate in horticulture uh, to sort of augment my, my education. Um, I do do garden design. Um, I do work directly in the, the landscapes and the projects uh, that we take on, but I also have a team of uh, good de you know, designers that probably are even more adept and skilled than I am. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm always learning uh, on the job, so to speak. Um, I wanted to share, and, and I'll touch on this briefly, my, what sort of inspired me to uh, step into this industry. When I was uh, a young child, I was pretty much raised by my grandmother and uh, grandfather. And so they really instilled that love of the natural world. And so the company uh, Bailey's Gardens actually had an early iteration 
uh, back in the 80s, my grandfather had started it. And at that time, uh, the focus was on uh, container gardens. He, he had actually developed a patented uh, container gardening system that made uh, gardening accessible to uh, people that had uh, special needs or were wheelchair bound or you know, otherwise restricted. And so, uh, you know, this uh, amazing system that he created uh, made the, the benefits of gardening accessible to them. And that was very much a seminal experience for me. Um, and I think really instilled very early that the love of the natural world and the interest um, ultimately in pursuing this uh, as a career. Um, and so I've, I've sort of carried on his legacy, if you will. Um, and so our mission, you know, we're really passionate about um, the work that we do. And um, I really feel this is about bringing joy to people, but also, um, you know, strengthening that connection with the natural world, which I think is sadly increasingly absent, particularly among children. And so um, in addition to carrying his, his legacy forward, I feel a real sense of purpose in um, encouraging that love of the natural world and, and helping to engender that um, in the work that we do. And so what I want to outline today uh, for this presentation, um, you know, we're going to touch more specifically on certain plants and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I also wanted to present a new framework of thinking um, around landscaping. And, and I hope that, that you know, we're able to achieve that and um, you know, kind of bring a different perspective to what landscaping really is. And, um, and I hope that that translates in terms of your own sense of, of purpose and meaning and, and the work that you do um, within your gardens and, and yards. Um, and I hope too that you will get some actionable steps and things that you know you can take from this and implement uh, right away. <clears throat> so I want to start with the idea of you know what our connection to to nature is, and um, I think that that's really important uh, defining this relationship to nature. I think so much now you know as I said, people are increasingly divorced from the natural world, um, and as I mentioned, you're seeing that a lot with kids. And so um, I think part of that, too, is a consequence of this idea that we have, that we have to master nature, that we have to control nature. Um, and so what I want to propose to you today is that we are actually nature. We are an extension of nature. We are part of nature. Um, so I want to you know, underscore that and also um, underscore the fact that the choices we make in our own landscapes uh, really matter. Um, they have consequence. So we will expound on that here shortly. Computer's a little frozen at the moment. Just give me one second. I'm sure everyone's used to technical difficulties with these. Still I think there. that's the motto of 2020 and 2021. Yeah, I think it is. We'll just be patient. All right, I think we've got it. Thank you for your forbearance. All right, so um, I won't spend too much time on this, but I did want to highlight sort of a brief history of landscaping, but really make the point that culture and religion and philosophy and social movements um, have all influenced landscaping. I think it's, you know, living in the modern age that we do, it's easy to sort of take it all for granted and not really interrogate or think about why we do the things we do. Why do we have lawns? You know. What do we consider attractive landscaping? Um, and so I, I hope with presenting this sort of this cultural tapestry and history uh, that surrounds landscaping that we can transcend some of the conventional thinking that exists and start to reframe how we look at our own landscapes. Um, th there's no question that, uh, again, landscaping has been deeply, deeply influenced by various movements. Um, and we'll, we'll look a little more um, uh, in detail at, you know, some of that uh, classicism and, and renaissance and so on. So uh, looking at European gardens, because that the trends that we see therein sort of found their way to America. So um, when we look back at sort of the ancient Greek and, and Roman gardens, um, you know, you, you see gardens that are highly formal, uh, highly stylized, um, architecturally, um, you know, very ornate, and I think you really see sort of the embodiment of that idea of mastering nature, really imposing uh, the will, uh, our will on nature and bringing it uh, under our control. Um, in the, the Middle Ages, it was sort of an interesting movement in that a lot of the peasantry 
uh, cultivated their own more cottage style gardens. And there was a utility to this. I mean, a lot of them uh, grew herbs and medicinal plants. Um, the aesthetic was also an important ethic in what they did. Um, but it was really, in a way, a rejection of the highly formal and stylized gardens um, that you saw you know, emerging from you know, even Egypt and Persia, as well as you know, uh, Greece and, and Rome. Um, and into the, the Renaissance, um, you kind of see the return, and, and certainly in, later into the neoclassicism, you see the, the return of these more formal gardens um, that, uh, that you saw earlier in sort of the classical period. And uh, then you have Romanticism, which kind of changed things a bit, particularly in the English gardens, um, and, and that eventually proliferated beyond England. But um, it was sort of connected to that antecedent of the middle medieval period where cottage gardens and more natural, uh, informal gardens became uh, sort of in vogue again. And um, maybe the one distinction being that, you know, the medicinal um, aspect was not as, as valued, but certainly the aesthetic, um, the more natural uh, cottage garden was, was uh, introduced. Um, sort of in slight contrast, that, that's where we also start seeing the idea of the lawn emerge, but it, it's more for you know, the elite, the aristocracy um, of the time. But, um, you know, be thinking about that. Um, this picture that I have here is actually from Manet's garden. So that was, you know, Southeastern France, Giverny, um, a place I've always wanted to visit, hope to do one day, um, you know, where life really imitated art with Manet. He was the great impressionist painter and uh, he spent a great deal of his savings actually uh, towards the end of his life in developing the gardens there. But you will see that influence of more of a cottage style, um, certainly it has form and structure, um, but you see more of a variety, um, less formal. Um, and that was, again, that whole English cottage style emerging out of England and to other parts of Europe. Um, and eventually, you know, they made their way here. Uh, so this here is an example of an ancient Roman garden. Again, you see the, you know, ornate uh, architecture and uh, very uh, formal. Um, here, an example of an Italian Renaissance garden, another very famous Italian Renaissance garden. I wanted to bring some imagery to this to, to really illustrate. Um, here is Versailles. So, um, you know, Louis XIV, you know, again, something very, very formal, another view of Versailles. And then here is um, one of my favorite gardens in Sissinghurst in England. It's a castle garden, um, more of the cottage style garden. So hopefully you can get some, some visual on uh, some of these distinctions. Um, Islamic gardens, I won't go too deep uh, into this, but I did want to just showcase it a bit. I had the opportunity to go to Turkey many years ago when I was 16, and so I had the, the chance to, to see um, gardens in this style, and so I thought it was important to, to present that here, and um, they're, they're lovely gardens, and again, this is an example of religion and culture really um, having influence on the philosophy around the garden, um, so you see, you know, usually water-centric a lot of fruit trees, beautiful lush flowers, high privacy walls, but sort of the impetus is to create this idea of paradise. Uh, so again, a heavy um, religious influence, you, you will see formality and, and of course, uh, you know, geometry in, in these gardens. You know, Asian gardens, which um, there are many forms of this from China to Malaysia to Japan, um, you know, it's, this could deserve its own <laughs> several hours of discussion. Um, but I do, I am partial to Japanese gardens. Um, I've done some work in Japan, and so I've had some opportunity to see some of these gardens as well. And again, uh, yet another example of the influence of religion and spirituality and culture um, in the, the philosophy of the garden. And then we get to the American garden. Um, and so, as I said, you know, American gardens were influenced um, by some thought leaders uh, in, in England and Europe. Um, but perhaps the best known landscape architect here is uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. He's, he's recognized for his work in, in Central Park um, and, of course, the Capitol grounds and uh, many other urban areas, including Chicago. Um, he was extremely influential um, in really, I think, founding the idea of landscape architecture here um, in the U.S. And I know with some of his urban designs, he introduced... Um, the idea of the lawn as a, as a way of connecting uh, communities. Um, it's also important to note that the lawn was, as I mentioned earlier, sort of a status symbol. And so, um, you know, the more people that were able to 
um, have lawns, it, it sort of garnered them this sense of status and, and prestige, if you will, that was uh, heretofore afforded to the more wealthy, the more elite. Um, so that democratization was an important movement. Um, when we look at early colonial America, I mean, we sort of uh, wore the, the ruggedness of, of America as a badge of honor. The, the ruggedness and natural world was, was more celebrated. Um, so over time, that began to change, and of course, with the you know development of the lawnmower, um, that also had an influence. So um, you know, this is a whole area of study on its own, but it is an interesting history and one that I would recommend. Um, you know, if, if you're interested in it, doing a deeper dive. Um, at least for me, it was I think helpful to understand where the idea of the lawn came from. This preoccupation that we have, particularly in the U.S., um, with lawns. Like I said, they are valued in England, but uh, not so much. Um, as they are here in the U.S., and I'm here today to challenge that somewhat as well. We will we will dive into that. So, sort of my manifesto um, when we're considering landscape design, and even with your own property and your own effort, regardless if you have a lot of land or you know even an urban or, or city lot, um, the three dimensions that you want to think about, of course, design, horticulture, and ecology. And so we will kind of step into each of these in turn. Um, so there are a couple, a number of design principles um, that I want to introduce to you. So the first is simplicity. Um, you know, less is more. That, that's an important thing to remember. And so if there are certain things in the landscape that aren't bringing visual impact, um, that don't really serve um, that end, think about um, whether or not it belongs. Um, trying to cram too much into your landscape um, can really be a challenge to a sense of form and structure. And um, the other thing is too, that it can be a hindrance to the use of the space, the function of the space. Um, so think in terms of simplicity uh, when you're, and, and we'll talk more about um, each of these. Uh, variety is an important design factor as well. So uh, when you look at some of the more formal gardens, um, as an example, the images I showed of, of Versailles or even the Italian Renaissance gardens, um, you see less variety, right? You see more green, you see a lot of use of box and you know, hedging. Um, and so with the cottage gardens, you see a lot more variety. Um, so it's not that one is right. Um, it's just depending on, and we'll discuss this in greater detail, but depending on the style that you elect uh, to use, um, you know, variety will be a factor. Balance is very important. So anything that you install into your your landscape um, has a sense of weight to it, your sense of mass, sense of presence. And so um, you want that to be distributed sort of throughout your landscape. Um, you don't want it to be too concentrated in one area. Um, that can really distort the balance. Now, again, in more formal types of gardens, um, or maybe one of the best ways to sort of illustrate this when you consider uh, your entrance to a, to a property or to your door, or to a porch, Sometimes you will see um, some type of plant framing, you know, maybe it's a small uh, tree or, or ornamental on either side. Um, and so that's an example of symmetry um, and balance. Uh, less formal gardens don't need symmetry, but they still do need balance. So always be thinking in terms of balance and again, distributing that idea of weight uh, throughout the design. Um, emphasis, so a good example of emphasis could be color, it could be other things, uh, texture, but you're, you're bringing focus to a certain area. So, um, you know, the use of, of certain uh, flowers may bring introduce color, and so you're emphasizing a certain area. Um, and so it's good, again, to kind of distribute this as well, because emphasis will uh, kind of lead the eye through the design. You will have certain focal points um, in the design, uh, so emphasis is an important design feature. Um, sequence uh, really refers to transition. Um, so, you know, it can be jarring if you have, you know, plants of really different heights, uh, you know, right next to each other or really different textures. The idea of sequence is to sort of create smooth transitions between different elements um, in the landscape. Uh, proportion is important. Uh, this speaks again to the idea of mass or, or size. And so if you have a small space um, that you've, you know, turned into a garden, but you put a huge tree, maybe it overwhelms the space, maybe it is not uh, of the right proportion um, because it will distract the eye from, from the rest of the garden. So always be thinking about proportion, you know, your size of 
the size of your space, uh, the plants that you have, and making sure that they all relate to each other in a way that is proportionate and not uh, jarring uh, to the eye. Um, unity, of course, is very important, bringing it all together. Um, that can be done visually uh, through repetition. Um, it's, you know, repetition is a, is a great way of doing that, so repeating certain plants uh, so that there's a sense of unity. Unity can be really bringing the space together, uh, achieving cohesiveness through walkways and uh, you know, hardscape structures that, that tie it all together. Um, but the whole idea is that even though they, there may be different focal points and you may have variety, like we talked about, there's still a sense of connectedness to the overall landscape. Um, so looking at horticulture, so this is a really important thing too. So there's the design aspect and you know that certainly matters, um, but you have to be able to choose the right plants for the space and, and keep them alive. <laughs> so um, some of the things to think about, and I know probably in your, your coursework, uh, you've talked a good bit about soil condition um, and soil testing. And I, I know that the Extension Service uh, has some resources available for that. Definitely recommend that. You have to start there uh, knowing uh, your soil. Unfortunately, in our area, um, you, you find a lot of clay, uh, inert clay. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, you know, light exposure. Um, one of the things I always recommend is performing a sun study and really just being acquainted with your land, you know, observing it throughout the day, seeing where the light travels, um, you know, being aware of environmental factors too, trees and buildings and things that also will affect uh, light exposure, um, even things like wind, if you have a very windy area. So um, I think becoming really um, intimate with your land, if that makes sense, with your property and observing it and trying to just really learn as much as you can about it really gives you um, insight and will then inform your discretion when it comes to selecting plants. Um, you know, you want to think about when the plants bloom, uh, you know, seasonal interests. It's ideal to maintain, you know, uh, seasonal interests throughout the year. Um, that's why, you know, evergreens are great, particularly as an example with, with foundation plantings, you know, you want 40 to 50 percent to be evergreen so that, you know, even in the winter, um, you know, you have uh, some display. Um, you know, thinking about the growth habits of the plants, how big do they get, how wide do they get, um, all of these different uh, dimensions of consideration are important. Um, you have to factor in all of these variables um, when determining which plants to select and which are going to uh, thrive, uh, you know, thrive in the environment that you have and also, um, you know, achieve the design standards that you set. So the, the horticulture is a very important thing to think about. Um, and then the ecology is really important. And I think this is gonna be something that's more and more topical. Uh, you know, it's, we really have created a crisis. Uh, we hear a lot about, you know, climate change. And um, I want you to sort of envisage, you know, North America before modern civilization. I mean, we had incredible uh, forests. I, I think over 90% of the, the forests have been logged um, and so through this increasing encroachment of development and quote unquote progress, we have created a lot of ecological havoc. And so, you know, one of the books, and I think it may have been recommended to your class, I know that it was recommended to us, um, it's called Nature's Last Hope. And um, the gentleman actually, I, I had started school at the University of Delaware, we share an alma mater, but the whole idea of this book, it really underscores the complex relationships that exist in nature, the ecological niches that exist, and how this development has really disrupted a lot of those. Um, and so you pair that with some of the invasive plant species that have been planted. Um, what, what we're getting is you know, loss of insect and bird species. We are disrupting the food chain. Um, and there are really uh, perilous consequences for that. Uh, one of the things that you'll find in that book too, it talks about only 5% of you know, the lower 48 states um, is really pristine ecologically speaking. So we've really, really fundamentally changed the land that, that we live on. And that's such an important consideration. Um, so 1 million species, they anticipate in decades to come likely in the next 20 years, um, 1 million species will be extinct, many of which are insects. Uh, so again, you know, hugely consequential um, to our way of life and really our survival. I mean, that is not hyperbole. Um, but part of the solution, uh, a big part of the solution is, is your landscape. 
So 85% um, of the land east of the Mississippi River is privately owned. Um, so, you know, as distressing as, you know, some of this information is, there is a solution in terms of our own stewardship, our own personal agency and how we treat and develop our own property. And again, that is if you have a small, you know, city lot or a sprawling, you know, rural uh, spread. Um, and one of the figures that uh, Tallamy cites, there are 50 million royal residential acres, 101 million acres in suburbia. Uh, so over 150 million acres that, that we have that we can directly affect, um, far more than any land that's been earmarked for conservation. So it's, this is really an important thing to, uh, you know, to prioritize and to uh, have in mind when you're thinking about your landscape and the choices, uh, the choices that you make. Um, some of the best practices, uh, so you heard me sort of decry uh, lawns. Uh, it's not to say that lawns are all bad. Uh, it's funny, I don't know if you know Monty Don, he's one of my favorite. Uh, he's not a formally trained horticulturalist, but he is a broadcaster and presenter in the UK. Uh, some of his shows have made their way here to um, the US. I think some of them are available on Netflix if you're interested. Um, but he was sort of lambasted in the news recently because he um, basically came out against lawns and talked about how terrible they are. And, and people were very sensitive to that and protective of their lawns. I'm not going to take a hard stance and say all lawns are bad, but it's important to note that they are essentially ecologically dead zones. And so to the extent that you can have less lawn and more plantings and the right plantings, um, that's better. So you, you see in here the keystone native plants. So um, Native plants um, are certainly better than ornamental. It does not mean that you can't have ornamental plants. So let's make that point first. Uh, it's been proposed uh, in looking at sort of some of the studies that have been done and the effects of different plantings on populations of birds and caterpillars and you know, certain moths and butterflies uh, that a certain ratio has emerged from that. And there's probably some variability here, but the idea is if you did 70%, um, you know, natives and 30% ornamental, uh, that you're still creating something that is ecologically robust. Uh, now, I'm not saying you have to follow that, but that is sort of um, a ratio that, that has been um, proposed. And, you know, you can have a formal landscape design with a lot of structure and a lot of form, but then the contents of that still be, you know, native plants. Um, it's also to make the distinction between native plants and the keystone native plants. So not all native plants are created equal. So one of the metrics that we're starting to look at is how productive are these plants? How hospitable are they to, you know, moths and butterflies? And so, you know, looking at that productivity metric, uh, they've pretty much distilled that roughly 5% of native plants produce over 75% of caterpillar food, as an example, uh, which is a big driver in you know, our broader uh, food web. So um, that's something to keep in mind. And I'm actually at the end of this, I'm going to, I meant to include in the presentation, but I'm going to share a resource that you can use where you can input your zip code. And, um, you know, you can even look up different plants and you can determine you can get data and see you know, one are these native and two, how productive are they? Um, I, one example of a, of a really good keystone plant is, is the oak tree. Uh, it's, you know, extremely productive, uh, ecologically speaking. So uh, again, we'll talk a little more about that at the end. Um, you know, encourage and support pollinators the best that you can. Um, I've even seen yards where, you know, again, a very small sort of, you know, city lot, um, but they define a certain area, a certain bed, and they fill it with, uh, you know, pollinators, you know, make a small pollinator garden. So again, do not feel constrained by the amount of land that you have. Um, it's best not to use chemical fertilizers, herbicides, uh, pesticides, uh, try to use organic uh, gardening practices, and even be mindful of, of water conservation um, in, in what you do. Another important thing to, to think about. So in terms of planning your own landscape, um, I like to tell people, you know, start with your goal. Uh, what are you trying to achieve? So we deal with people in very different situations. Sometimes people just want to sell their property. And so very pragmatically, they're looking for a way to improve their curb appeal, uh, maybe give a little home value, but really just improve the presentation of the property and, and facilitate uh, the sale of the property. Um, and in that instance, you know, generally formal, uh, more formal style is best. 
Um, but you know, that's something to think about. What, what do you want to uh, use the space for? Are you looking to entertain family? You know, is it a backyard uh, entertainment area? Is it a water garden maybe to bring the family together, maybe introduce a little more joy? Um, if you have kids, uh, you know, you want to be thinking about, you know, what are your goals? What are the functions um, that you're trying to achieve? That's always the first place to start uh, when you're thinking about your landscape. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, what style do you like? Um, now, there, there are many nuances here, but generally you're looking at a more formal style versus a more informal or natural style. So you'll look at maybe your neighborhood, uh, your house itself, um, how much land you have, and just your personal preferences. You know, do you like cottage gardens? Um, do you like, you know, Japanese Zen gardens? Um, do you have a lot of trees? Are you interested maybe in a woodland garden? Um, so, you know, think about, uh, you know, what style that you like. And I always encourage people to, to look around and, and draw inspiration from, from other properties, from, uh, you know, other gardens, even gardens of note, um, and really uh, spend time thinking about what they like, because you've got to live with it. So, and if you're doing it yourself, it's a lot of work. So it's got to be something that you, you like and that you want. Um, and again, all of this said with keeping in mind sort of the ecological uh, consequences of, of what you're doing. Um, and then, you know, the best thing I always tell people is put it on paper, even if you're obviously not a professional landscape designer or garden designer, uh, getting it on paper is really, really helpful um, because it can be hard from our perspective to understand the interactions of the plants, the sizes and everything. So creating a good aerial design um, is really, really helpful in bringing it all together and um, kind of crystallizing that design. Um, spend time with it. You know, it, it's not something you want to rush. Um, so one of the tools to do that, um, well, here, well, first, here's an example. So this is one that I had done. This is just a foundation planning, but this, you know, this bird's eye view, the sort of that aerial perspective, you can see how um, it's much easier to understand, you know, what space you're working with, what fits where. Um, so there are a couple ways of doing this. You can go get measurements uh, yourself, um, which you know doesn't have to be that time consuming, but it's a little more tedious. Or there is a shortcut, if you will, and I even use it. I usually, you know, for jobs, we collect measurements, but we also use uh, Google Maps. It's a great tool. So you can enter your property address um, and you can actually collect measurements um, on Google Maps. So assuming the satellite data is there and your property is there, um, you know, you'll get to see your property, your dimensions, um, you'll be able to measure things out um, and even see other elements like trees and, and, and other things that, that might be present on your property. So it's a great tool uh, to use. And, um, you know, I'm happy at the end of all this, I will share my information. If you have any questions on how to use that tool or any other questions, um, you know, I'm glad to, to email you information and even a tutorial on that because I found it to be immensely helpful um, it, it gives you a terrific base map that uh, I, I think you'll find very helpful in putting together a plan. Um, and the final thing I want to leave you with is we talked about design principles. We've talked about horticulture um, and we've talked about ecology. And again, all of those are important dimensions um, in planning your garden and your space. But I also want you to think in terms of personal expression, um, you know, make it uniquely yours. Um, because ultimately, I think you will find the most reward in that. Um, so I want to make that point, uh, you know, make it yours. Uh, use it as a form of your own expression. Use plants that you like and uh, create a space that you really will enjoy. Um, so anyway, I leave you with that. I will um, stop my share here and then we can um, talk about uh, any questions you might have. And then I might resurrect the share at some point because I did want to show you a resource that I think you will find helpful uh, from the National Wildlife Federation, their website, um, where you can you know, enter your zip code and it will give you a list of trees, shrubs, perennials, everything that is native, and will even give you some data on how productive these different uh, plants are. So anyway, thanks so much for your time. I look forward to your questions. No question. Oh, the one just came in, but Deanna comments in the chat that she's worked with your grandfather in real estate and he was oh, a wow. wonderful person. That is so cool. That is so neat to hear. I appreciate that comment very, very much. So um, I will wait for a few specific plants 
questions um, of CTSC, you have your hand raised, but Deborah does ask about wisteria specifically in the Q&A. Yep, so uh, whether or not to use wisteria, well, there are divided opinions on that. And well, first I wanna make the point. So I am, um, I am a, I do design gardens. Um, I am not a landscape architect um, and I am not a, you know, a formal horticulturalist, um, even though, again, I'm continuing my education. So I do wanna make that disclaimer, but I will give you the best information that I can. Um, and if there's anything I don't know, we can certainly get back to you. Like I said, I have a whole team of people um, that I work with that are probably more erudite than I am. But uh, wisteria, there are divided opinions on it. Me personally, I like wisteria. Um, you know, it's something that it can be invasive, it can be aggressive. Um, but if it's something that you're going to tame and control, um, me personally, I like it. So it's, I think it's a matter of personal interest. And going back to that idea of even if you had a good proportion of your plants as natives, and particularly the keystone plants, um, you have a good 30, 40 percent of ornamentals that you can introduce. And so, um, you know, why not include it in that? Um, that's my thinking. And Kathleen, you have your hand raised. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. What's your question, Kathleen? Oh, she put it in the chat. We live on the mountain and are surrounded by deer. What flowers will they not eat? That's a really good question. Well, there, so that's a very good question. Um, there are a number of plants, um, you know, there are a number of shrubs uh, that are deer resistant. Um, the best way, because the, this is an expansive thing. There are a lot of plants that they will eat. There are a lot of plants that they won't eat. My best recommendation would be first to determine um, what types of plants are you looking at, shrubs, perennials, and then from there, what are you interested in introducing? What do you like? And then look up if they are deer resistant or not. That's probably the best way because it is such a huge list. Um, and it really depends again on what, what we're talking about. If we're talking about, um, you know, shrubbery or, um, you know, perennials. Um, the other thing, of course, if you're growing any type of, type of food um, or anything that is attractive to deer, uh, then you have to look at, you know, forms of barrier and, and that sort of thing. But uh, if you have specific uh, plants in mind, um, you know, we could definitely determine are they deer resistant or, or not. That's probably something, Arthur, that's the most overwhelming about landscaping is there's just so many plants and not even so knowing plants. where to start is, is such a, a chore almost. It is. Um, well, you know, there's some, I mean, when you're looking at that, uh, certainly if you're looking for foundation plantings, uh, you know, there are a lot of great shrubs like boxwood and yew. And, um, you know, they're just, you know, Japanese purists. There, there's a lot of different um, options there. But again, it goes back to what are the conditions? Is it a shady area? Is it a, is it a you know, sunny area? Um, you know, all those things matter. Um, what, what is my soil? You know, if you're, if you're growing hydrangeas, um, you know, if you're, if you're growing blueberries, uh, they like more acidic soil. I mean, all of these factors matter. So again, I think it always, the best place to start is with understanding the land itself, how much sun, how much shade, what's my soil condition. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, on the soil side, you're not necessarily precluded from doing something, but you might have to amend it. Um, but it's important to know those conditions because that really gives you a sense of boundary in terms of what you can and can't do, and that helps narrow it. And then, you know, the other filter, again, looking at ornamentals versus natives and, and keystone plants. Um, when we start working through some of those filters, it does help to narrow it down. Um, but also, again, personal preference. Are there things that you really like? Um, you know, that matters too. So it's a, it, you know, it's a process to reconcile all of these different factors. But um, in sort of going through that exercise, I think it, it takes this huge expansive list uh, and helps to start to narrow it a bit. 
and, on and that, style style too, right? You know, is it formal? Is it informal? Um, on that train of thought, Paula um, does say her property is quite shaded. She would like to plant trees or shrubs or something that will provide her with some privacy. Um, so the place that she's planning is also shaded and is looking for recommendations on um, a tree or a shrub that would thrive in that shady spot. So, well, I love, I mean, one of my favorite privacy trees is, uh, is Thuja um, and it can tolerate, you know, full sun to fairly shady. Um, I, you know, I'd want to, before I ever make any recommendations, I like to see the property. I like to sort of do my own sun study and really understand how much light we're talking about, how much shade we're talking about. But I think it's one of the best uh, privacy screens if you're looking to create a privacy screen. Um, Leland Cypress is another. I know in our area that uh, some of the, the Leland Cypress has been subject to a blight. Um, I've heard instances of uh, people planning, you know, 30 or more creating this incredible screen and then it, they all get sick and, and succumb to the blight. So, um, you know, Fuji is really hardy, um, a great privacy screen, pretty fast growing. Um, you know, in terms of shrubs and shaded, shaded area, I mean, azaleas are, are lovely and, and they uh, like the shade. Uh, hydrangeas, you know, like at least partial shade, do very well on that. And, you know, you get some really floriferous big blooms um, that will last through the summer into the fall. Um, so, you know, azaleas, hydrangeas are a couple of, of uh, shrubs you can think about for shaded areas for sure and can you type the name of that tree in the chat oh yeah sure and going over to the chat deborah asks if you have um recommendations for a plant that would be green in the winter but flowers in the summer flowers in the summer and are we talking a um like a shrub i assume or um i'll let her clarify what she means and I mean, while you know, she's you doing that we have some others in the Q and A. Um, Joanne wants to know about the cicadas. Should she be concerned? Well, one, I was just going to touch on the, the previous question. Um, you know, autolucans are great because they, they um, early part of the summer, so autolucans uh, would, would probably fit the bill for that. But there are many others. Um, you, you know, I. It would, uh, again, depend on some of those other factors I, I talk about. That's what's so tough about this sometimes because, you know, you can name several plants, but it, it's got to be a fit for the conditions um, that are there. And she does and what say, was the yeah, question yeah, so, about? Well, uh, Deborah did cicadas. clarify shrub or a, a bush that would um, be green in the winter and, and flower. Oh, yeah, and, and autolucans, I mean, they, they're technically a tree in a way, but they're used as, as uh, shrubs and um I really like them, so I would definitely look at, at that. Um, you know, Nandinas are beautiful. There's uh, there's so many varieties, um, sort of semi deciduous. Uh, some of them bloom nicely. Um, they, depending on the variety, they can produce a beautiful fall effect as well. Um, sort of a bronzing of the leaves. Um, you know, I love oak leaf hydrangea. There's another example. They bloom a lot in the in the summer, and then um, they kind of have that effect too, where their their leaves turn into the fall. And even the flower heads, even as they die, um, they kind of maintain a really cool visual interest. Uh, so I love those. I think they're really neat. Um, but and of course, you know, roses. Uh, now they won't be green year round, but um, one of the roses that you have your heritage roses you know, for the rosarians of the world or the people that are really into roses. Um, but if you're looking for something that's really low maintenance, but will give you an amazing summer bloom, um, knockout roses, you see them a lot in landscape, even in commercial landscape. Um, for that reason, they are very low maintenance. They're very hardy, disease resistant, and um, produce a lot of uh, bloom. You know, you as a general practice, of course, you should deadhead, but Knockouts are one of those amazing plants that even if you don't deadhead, they will produce. Um, though you will optimize the production by deadheading. But um, I'm very partial to them, especially, again, if you're not looking for something that is too difficult to maintain. Um, they bring a lot of color. They have a lot of different uh, varieties uh, and different colors that you could introduce to the landscape. So I'm a big fan of the, the knockout rose for a summer bloom. So yes, circling back around to um, should people be concerned about what they plant because of the cicada emergence? 
it's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I don't know that I am knowledgeable enough to say, you know, yes, no, or otherwise. What I would say is, you know, don't not plant, <laughs> you know, because you should plant. Uh, but, um, you know, it's something to be aware of, I, I suppose. And, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm, as you saw, I'm not a big proponent of any sort of chemical uh, pest control or anything like that. Um, it's a very convoluted issue. I mean, there are people that are just far more erudite than me in terms of pest management and how to do it. I mean, for instance, you can, for aphids, you can introduce ladybugs into the garden. You know, there are a lot of natural sort of uh, remedies, uh, organic uh, remedies that you can employ. I don't know a direct solution with the cicada. Um, that's something I would have to look into it. And, you know, I will look into that further and, and maybe I could share that with you, Emily, to uh, share with the rest of the class. But I would just say, you know, carry on and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what the I The only um, advice I've specifically seen on cicadas is in regards to new fruit tree plantings. You might want to okay. either delay then, those or cover them with a netting. Okay. Um, with just because yeah. I think the concern is that they could damage the wood to a point where it impacts the health of the tree. But they will defoliate other shrubbery, but I don't believe that they, they don't uh, harm like much. lasting damage. You know, it's ugly, but... Or you could always delay planting till after they're gone because they're only out for about six weeks. So yeah, it's uh, not very long. What what is that? Do you know that date range that they're out? Um, it's early May through mid June is about okay. the range. Once those soil temperatures warm up, it's it's subject to that. That's a good thing to note. I like to do you know spring is a good time to start laying out your summer garden and summer planting. But uh, yeah, maybe you have to delay it a little bit. I always tell people, well, there was that old rule of thumb, you know, waiting till after Mother's Day. But but certainly, you know, early May I think is a good time. Um, you know, fear of frost is more or less expired at that point. Um, you want to be circumspect about being too eager and uh, you know, planting too early in the spring with certain things. Obviously, with the threat of frost still being present. Yeah, and I, I did receive a, a private message from someone else on on the call that says that they. Um, saw a recommendation elsewhere on just delaying planting till fall, which is also a possibility. I do a lot of, so a lot of tree planting and shrub planting I do in the fall. And, um, you know, because there's less uh, irrigation requirement too, there's less heat stress on the plant. Fall is a great time, especially with trees and shrubs. And obviously your spring bulbs, uh, you need to plant in the fall. Barbara asked, does your company have a physical location? So we don't have a physical location or showroom, uh, I and mean, we do have a physical office, but we, um, it's not necessarily customer facing. We are in the process of um, sort of a feasibility study on doing a, a nursery. I mean, we are going to do it. I just don't know when. I doubt it would be in time for this season, but probably for next season, we do plan to have a nursery. Um, that's something I really want to do. Um, so I appreciate the question, but not quite yet, but we will be there hopefully within the next year. There's, there's a few in different places, so I promise I'm getting to everybody, um, trying to get them in the right order. Um, just a comment from Chuck. Um, he says he didn't have much problem with cicadas back when he had an orchard, but he worried a lot more than they actually damaged. So that that that's, that's, that's kind probably. of a funny point. Um, and Stefan asks, we have about 300 feet of property that has about a 13% slope. And he's curious on ideas on how to implement steps with level land. Is there a height and depth that is ideal? Um, so when you get into, you know, that sort of thing, um, it depends on um, certain factors, but you have, for something like that, yeah, you're going to want to excavate and you're going to want to, you know, create compaction. Um, we do do steps and hardscapes and we sometimes with slopes like that, we even do a uh, terrace system. Um, but, you know, I actually love slopes and banks because I think they had a lot of visual interest so you can even terrace them. Um, but in terms of steps, um, it's a little more convoluted. Um, I have a, a, a gentleman that runs that division, my construction manager, you know, he's been doing hardscapes for 30 years. Um, I let him, you know, I don't do the hardscapes uh, as much. Uh, so, you know, I could get back to you on that in terms of the exact requirements for the exact depth um, for steps. Um, you know, it, it does depend. I know for patios, you want a good 16 inches. We just did a um, 
a system called it's it's a soak pool. It's it's a plunge pool and it's a prefabricated concrete pool. It's a thirty thousand pound concrete box, if you will. And I know that we did um, a good two feet of you know digging of compaction uh, just to support that. But uh, for steps, obviously, you wouldn't need that much depth and compaction. But I could get back to you on that. I, I would check with him and see if you're looking to do it yourself and, and give you some recommendations on that. I was mute myself. Paige asks, can you discuss how to convert a lawn slash field to a pollinator garden? Um, she's talking about an area that's about three to five acres. And is there a difference between a pollinator garden versus a meadow? Well, I think, you know, pollinator gardens can be very small. So, you know, particularly people that have small spaces, they, you can make a really small pollinator garden. There's no real requirement there. When you have larger swaths of land, yeah, if, if a lot of that becomes a pollinator garden, um, at what point does it become a meadow? I wouldn't say there's a huge distinction there. Um, though uh, you're seeing that more and more people creating meadows and um, I would like to see people here doing that. So I think that's a very admirable goal that you have. Um, and so, you know, there's no rule. Um, you know, it depends on how much area you want to define uh, for the for the meadow. Um, but yeah, I think if it's a pretty big space of land, it, it, you could probably identify it as a meadow. And again, there, there are certain uh, plants uh, and natives that you would want to use um, to to do that. Um, but a pollinator garden, so a meadow wouldn't, if done right, would in fact be a pollinator um, site. Um, I would think of a pollinator garden as maybe a smaller, more defined area, which again, if you, even if you have a very small front yard, you can define a very small area um, for the purpose of, I mean, I'm talking literally, I've seen you know, three by three, you know, and all these, you know, echinacea and everything else is crammed in. Um, so I think that's important to note that even if you have a small bit of land, you can make a pollinator garden, but good for you to have, you know, that amount of land and, and uh, you could really, create some impact. Um, there was a gentleman I, I had uh, seen a while back that um, he was in the UK and he spent decades of his life um, kind of rebuilding this land that had become barren. It, it was once this flourishing meadow and he, he basically reconstituted this meadow. I don't remember the exact, I mean, it was a, just a gigantic uh, piece of land, um, but that's something that, that you can do. And um, I think more and more people are doing that. So. I would definitely encourage you to do that. As far as starting that process though, Arthur, would you recommend um, overseeding into the existing, um, it sounds like there's an existing ground cover there or kind of starting from scratch? I, I think for optimal conditions, maybe you start from scratch, you know, and, and work the soil and, and uh, you know, that would be my approach to it. Um, I'm not saying that you couldn't just go in and crop some seeds and see what happens, but um, I would, I would, you know, to really create the right conditions, I would start from scratch. That would be my recommendation. And Kathleen asks a question about if I plan to plant blueberry bushes this year and keep the deer away with the garden fencing. If I put netting over the bushes to prevent birds from eating the fruit, will they still flower and bear fruit? I, I guess the short answer is yes. Um, you know, as long as the netting is not, you know, too heavy or, or damaging to the plant. Um, but there's proper netting that you can get uh, that, that I, you know, wouldn't damage the plant. And yes, definitely do uh, fencing. And of course, you know, anything like that's going to need a good bit of sun, probably at least six hours of sun. And, and again, you want to look at the soil pH, um, you know, when, when growing blueberries. I don't know if you've talked yeah. anything about um, we we touched a little bit on, on mostly tree fruit but a little bit on small fruit uh, Kathleen that is a common practice in commercial like you pick operations they have a pretty extensive netting that goes over top to keep the birds um Deborah adds a and the Q and A adds a comment on the cicadas that when um, she was living in New York and the brood came out they had roses tulips and hydrangeas that were never harmed so it's nice to hear other um, experiences on the last time sure. they came because it's been so long it has i know i was just thinking that in the last time it was 
So, okay, back over to the chat. Sarah asks, I'd like to do a sun study of my yard. How many data points would I really need to understand what I have? Are there particular times of year I should look at it? And do I need anything more than that start stop time? Those are good, very good questions. Um, so, you know, I don't want to make it too complicated or imply uh, that it's too complicated. Um, in terms of the time of year, I mean, you know, certainly uh, when you're looking at growing plants in spring and summer, um, you know, you're going to have more sun during that period. Uh, so that's a good time to do it. Um, you're going to have, of course, less sun in, in the winter. Um, but the data points really are just seeing how the sun travels, looking at, at any sources of obstruction, uh, trees. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be anything formal, but it's just to gain an understanding of where the light's traveling um, and understanding, you know, what you're looking to put there and how much sun is it going to be able to, to get. Um, you know, those are the factors you, that you want to look at. Uh, you know, even looking at um, like Google Maps is helpful in terms of establishing a sense of direction. Um, but really the best thing is just observing your property and kind of throughout the day, even if you keep a journal, I mean, I've done that too, um, you know, different parts of the day and kind of taking note, it becomes multivariable in that again with buildings and trees and other, it's not simply a matter of just looking at the direction. It's a matter of looking at all of these other um, elements that might exist, you know, on, on your property. That's that a great sense. point. And also, um, Definitely wait till you got leaves on the trees because there's that's a, that's several points. Yes. Yep. In terms of time of year, right. Wait till, yep. Yeah. Not only are we at a better length with daylight, but also um, it becomes a lot shadier when you get those leaves on that big oak tree in your backyard. And I know that from experience. <laughs> Another question on what types of plants would be best to control erosion on a slope? That's a good question, Paula. It's a good question. Um, I mean, I think plants in general uh, provide great erosion control. And so I think, you know, certainly certain trees and, you know, more substantial plants will provide uh, good erosion control. Um, so it, it would just depend. But uh, again, I think plants in general provide erosion control. I don't know that I would mark one over the other but uh what about specific plants for uh, ground cover like on a sloping bank so, so i love i mean there are a lot of options there um you know in spring you know the, the creeping flocks i think is very lovely um its bloom is fleeting um but you know that's one to think about um ajuga provides a beautiful uh ground cover um i tell you a plant that i'm i'm very partial to that you can use as a as a ground cover, though it's not it's not as low growing in its habit as say flocks, but um, it is geranium rosanna. It's a hardy geranium, and um, it was named the plant of the century by the Royal Horticulture Society. But what's great about it is it has an amazing bloom period, basically from spring into the fall, and um, it has sort of a mounding habit, but it spreads very nicely. And uh, again, that bloom period is really remarkable. Um, it was a husband and wife who had been, you know, they each sort of had some connection or background of horticulture and, and um, but they weren't necessarily formally trained but their families had, you know, been involved in different initiatives but they grew a lot of hardy geraniums in their garden and I guess there was, you know, this new plant emerged, was pollinated by accident uh, but they started to notice, hey, th this bloom seems to endure a lot longer than any of the others and um, they eventually brought in some specialists to verify that. And, and uh, so, you know, it became this great plant. It was named for the wife, uh, Roseanne, but I love that as, as a ground cover. Again, it'll grow a little taller, um, but it, it spreads so nicely. Um, so I really like that. Karen asks about Lily of the Valley. What, what specifically are we? Um... Um, I'll give her a minute like to, to clarify. <laughs> I, I think it. I think that. What are your thoughts on it? I love it. <laughs> no, I mean it. Um, I like Lily of the Valley. Uh, again, it just it's one of those things. It's it's a matter of of uh, you know personal preference. What what you like. Uh, but yeah, I. I well, as ground cover, pardon? she she's wondering as ground. Cover. Oh, as a ground. I'm sorry, I didn't. I, yeah, I get. Yeah, you could use it. I guess as a, as a ground cover. Um, I, I don't know that it spreads quite as 
like some of the others I mentioned. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. You know, you have to look at your density of planting. Um, but yeah, I think you could definitely use it as a, as a ground cover. Um, some of that is relative too. I mean, if um, depending on what's there and what's around it, you know, if you have a, a large tree and there's shade, um, but something could be a ground cover, but be a little taller. If you have lower shrubs, if something's a ground cover, but it gets a little too tall, maybe it creates a disproportion there. So that's something to think about too, um, if that makes sense. Um, but I'm sort of of the mind that not all ground covers have to be right, you know, right on top of the ground. They can have some height. Um, but then it, again, would depend on what's around it and how that affects the proportion of what's around it. Does that make sense? And Paula asks for you to repeat that type of geranium you were talking yep, about. Yep, it's uh, geranium roseanne, like the name roseanne. Um, and I want to say it's with a Z. So I think it's R O Z A N N E. And is that a perennial? It is a perennial. Um, yep, it's a hardy geranium. It is a perennial. It will, um, it will spread very nicely and it will come back. Um, but yes, it is a herbaceous perennial. And we just have one more and then maybe let's switch gears and you can check out, we can check out that site you were talking about. Yeah, sure. sure, um, sure. Kathleen asks if you have a plant that will not flower, um, a viburnum that's seven years old and otherwise appears healthy, what steps would you recommend? She hasn't had much luck through the local. Yeah, nursery. I love viburnum. Um, and in fact, we have uh, a couple different varieties uh, on our property. Um, if you have a situation like that, I mean, you want to, First thing I would do is you know check the soil, test the soil. Um, it could be an issue of nutrient deficiency, um, and again, there's so many varieties of viburnum, and you know some like different conditions. But um, I would also confirm that the spot where it is 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 uh, a good spot because if it's not getting a sun, enough sunlight, that could also uh, affect whether or not it it produces. So you know definitely check the soil, and I would check. Um, you know, the location just to confirm that it's properly placed and is getting, uh, the conditions are adequate to, to its needs. Um, that's where I would start. Um, if it's, you know, it doesn't sound like it's presenting with uh, any symptoms of disease or anything like that. So I, I would imagine you know, some kind of nutrient deficiency or, uh, you know, just not enough sunlight. And I lied, there's a couple more that came popped up in the chat. John asked, we have a total of eight acres. Um, about half of it is lawn and garden. The other half is pretty wild. Sometimes they let a nearby farmer come and um, harvest hay on those fields, just two cuttings. But from an ecological standpoint, would it make more sense and be more responsible to just let it grow wild to promote more natural plant growth? Yeah, and, you know, I want to make the point, I mean, it's, it's your property and, and you have to use it as you see fit. And, um, you know, I definitely don't want to guilt people into, you know, doing things, but it's good that we regard the ecological consequences of what we do. So I guess it would depend, I mean, because you mentioned there's a good part of the, the property that's already wild. Um, and I don't know that there's a magic number. I mean, I, you know, I've heard different numbers sort of bandied about, but um, I mean, eight acres is a good bit of land and I don't know what percentage of it is, is wild, but, you know, if you had 20, 30% of it, that's wild. Um, I feel like you're doing your duty there. And um, so, um, but certainly if you wanted to uh, purpose more of it um, for a wild area, um, I, I think that's a very noble thing. And, and I always encourage it um, there. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Miyazaki forests, but um there's, there's a Japanese botanist who had developed the idea. Um, now it's, it, you know, you can do it on very small land, areas of land. That's why I did it. I mean, it's more for urban uh, areas, but you can certainly do it with your own property. But the idea is, of course, you condition the soil, but you plant a high density of native uh, trees and shrubs and you, you plant them very close together. And so this creates an environment of competition and so what happens is the growth of these uh, plants is really accelerated. So within, you know, within like a decade, you've got basically a forest, a proper forest um, and really an ecological haven. So I'd encourage you to check out, um, look up Miyazaki Forest. Again, I'm not saying someone should do it on the property, but with eight acres, it might be something that, um, that you could do. But the whole idea is you can do it on really small bits of land too. But it's particularly, it particularly as utility in, in urban areas where very small, um, you know, areas of land, but they're looking to really 
optimize um, the ecological value of those areas. Um, but something worth checking out, uh, kind of in the spirit of, of this idea of you know, uh, you know, stewardship and and uh, you know, making parts of your land more wild and, and untouched. Um, I, I just think it's beautiful too. You know, I, I I fear losing that connection with with the natural world too, um, just as an experience. So if, anytime you can invite that into your property, I think is just enriching spiritually, frankly. And John, my advice would be get a goat. Get a goat? <laughs> get a goat. <laughs> but um, on that same thought of spirituality, Deborah, um, last question in the Q&A. If you were making a whimsical garden cottage, cottage, almost like the Hobbit type garden, what plant recommendations would you have for that aesthetic? Well, I love cone flowers. You know, I think they're, they're very... Uh, you know, magical and, and whimsical. So I, I'm really partial to them because, you know, the big flower heads and to, to me, they look otherworldly. Um, I love the colloquial term for it is pin cushion. Um, I love those too. They're very whimsical because they have these, these stems that are kind of sinuous and twist about in these beautiful, um, you know, light blue or lavender blooms. Uh, I think they're, those are two that when you say whimsical, um, that's what it provokes in, in my thinking. Um, and I think any cottage type garden, um, you gotta have some kind of rose in my opinion. I, I just, you know, you always think of the classic English garden uh, with the rose, I, I think they're very magical. Um, so those are all recommendations that I have, but there's so many, you know, there's so many, um, you know, salvia is beautiful with the nice vertical entry, the spikes of purple. Um, I think they translate very well. Delphiniums are you get a lot of height with those, but they're magical. They can get really tall, and again, gives you that vertical interest. I love them uh, for cottage for cottage gardens. Um, there's just so many, but those would be some that um, I would identify. But I'll probably think of a hundred more. <laughs> you know. Um, I think I caught a few of those coneflower, salvia, delphiniums, if there's any others. And then the pincushion flower I love, uh, corn flowers I love. I think they're great for cottage gardens. Um, the the uh, pincushion, I think it's uh, um, columbaria uh, scabiosa or something like that. I'd have to look it up, look it up real quick. But I, I love that. Very whimsical in, in my view. I just think it's... Uh, Just looking it up really quickly. And what about climbing roses? Yeah, Scabiosa columbaria. Yeah, love climbing roses. Yeah, great for, for a cottage garden too. Um, there, there's so many varieties. Um, I don't have a ton of experience with, I have a couple of climbing roses. Um, kind of the area uh, where we uh, planted them, I don't think they were getting enough sun. So we, we had a little trouble with them, but we've moved them. But I do love climbers. Uh, you know, obviously, if you have a pergola or you know, some type of structure that supports you know, clematis, also great climbers, and they can pair very nicely with uh, climbing roses. All right, let's switch over um, just in yeah, the next, five, over the next five minutes and just um, introduce everybody to that site. I'll also type it in the chat so everybody can use it on their own. Yeah, let, what, you know, the problem I'm having is my darn computer is frozen. Um, what is the site? I can pull it up. So I can give you the site. Just give sure. me one sure. second. Um, of course, I have the link right here on the computer, and I can't get to it. But it's, um, I think it's the, I want to say it's NSF. We'll see how good my memory is here. Uh, NSF.org uh, slash plant finder. Not that that is that challenging to remember, but um, hopefully I remembered it correctly. But NSF.org or NWF, I'm sorry, nwf.org slash uh, plant finder. And, um, and then it should give you the opportunity to enter your zip code. Um, and then it will populate a huge list. I will warn you, it is a big list of plants, but what you can do, it will uh, partition them into your tree shrubs and so on. But the other thing you can do is you can look up a specific plant. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so if you had a question about a specific plant, you can also type that in and um, based on your location, it will tell you, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a good native plant to use and what its production uh, capability is. 
it's a great, great tool. And I, and I do apologize. I meant to include it in the, um, in the presentation. Okay. So the native plants by my zip code, I sent my zip code to Carnesville. Yeah. And then you should be able to scroll down because it should have trees, shrubs, and others too. You've got your grasses and so on. And then you can drill down. You could pick one, um, you know, like pick the birch there as an example. Um, and it will give you some more data points on, you know, how productive it is. I see you also can save them too. Yep, you can save them. Yeah, you can build a whole list. See, so 299 species of butterflies and moths use this as a caterpillar host in your area and then they give you their the top 15 it, it's really a, a great tool um you know i'm not an entomologist i mean you know it's a whole world when, when you're looking at insects and the intricacies of how they relate but they're but they're often very specialized to the plant because you know plants as a general thing uh you know plants uh have chemicals and uh you know compounds that deter uh predation. And so the relationship between plants and certain insects is very, very specialized. And so that's why a tool like this is so great, because you can really drill down and understand which plants are appropriate um, to your area and what they're going to attract. And that is a really great point, because um, when we talk about invasive species, um, particularly the spotted lanternflies, the newest one in the United States, they are attracted to the tree of heaven as a host. There's something about they're both from the same area or there's some chemical compound within the tree of heaven that attracts the spotted lanternfly. So it's funny how these invasives um, gravitate towards each other's uh, each other as well. And thank you, Chuck, for sticking that link in the chat and saving me from having to try and pull the chat box up. This is this is very cool. Yeah, it's a great tool, and um, and frankly, I'm just I've sort of just gotten acquainted with it. Um, you know, I, I plan to to dive deeper, um, but um, I also recommend the book uh, Nature's Last Hope or Nature's Best Hope. Um, can't remember which it was, Doug Tallamy, but uh, a worthwhile read for sure. Um, I think it's heartening to know that you know way that we um, care for our, our yards and our gardens uh, is really, really bears consequence to some of these ecological challenges that exist. So I, I think it's heartening. It's just a matter of proliferating that message and, and really getting enough people to, to participate and understand that. I think it'll be somewhat challenging uh, here because again, you know, people love their lawns and, and we've developed a certain um, attitude and mentality around what uh, a properly uh, landscaped yard uh, looks like. And that is somewhat at odds with what is, you know, best ecologically. So, you know, those two things will have to be reconciled. Um, and so that's why I would encourage, you know, people to do it and to share that with friends, family, and so on, and, and really, uh, you know, disseminate that message. Kathleen asks about um, locations to buy native plants. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think more and more nurseries are going to prioritize uh, natives. Um, I've worked with uh, Meadows Farms a lot, and um, they use a lot of really good local growers, and um, they sell, of course, a lot of um, a lot of ornamentals, um, but you know, I do think it's definitely a source for some uh, local, uh, for certain things, you know, you might grow from seed, you know, it just depends. Um, but that's a really good question. And, um, you know, that's something that I hope that natives will be more accessible. But, you know, Meadows, I think, is a pretty good uh, resource. Um, and if, if it's something they don't have, usually they're helpful in sourcing it. Um, so I've developed a really good relationship with them. Of course, we've worked with some really big like wholesale nurseries uh, like Taylor's and they basically ship up and down the East Coast and they have a huge selection of, uh, of plants. But, um, you know, I don't know if they're, I don't think they have more of a retail facing operations, mostly wholesale. 
but uh, definitely meadows and, and things that you can't find, um, you know, maybe grow from seed uh, in, in the instances that you can. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. And Mary um, puts another useful site to find native plants by growing zones. So by, by your climate um, on prairiemoon.com. And I think Prairie Moon is a nursery that, that will ship native plants. Thanks for sharing that. I'll, I'll take that down too, because that's helpful. And CT does say that in the Eastern Panhandle, a good area to grow hollyhocks that I've seen in a cottage um, is the Eastern Pan, excuse me, is an Eastern Panhandle a good area to grow hollyhocks for a cottage garden? Um, why don't we look at, I would be curious, maybe we could look it up on the plant finder really quick too and see. Why don't we do that? What it, what it says. That's what I was sort of hoping that we could do, uh, you know, as an exercise. Okay. And um, Mary also says Sunny Meadows Farm. And I'm glad she mentioned that because I was Sunny thinking, Meadows, I know, yes, I know there's another one, but I couldn't think of what it was. Yep. I love Sunny Meadows. Yep. Thanks for mentioning that too. Yep. They have a good selection too for water gardens. I let, I'm very partial to water gardens and we're making that more of a service focal point um, this season. Uh, but, you know, it's great to encourage wildlife and just for joy. I, I think, you know, Water gardens bring a lot of joy uh, to the garden. Um, you know, the sensory dimension with, of course, the sound and sort of a cooling effect in the summer, but uh, it, it's, uh, that's something to think about too and, and bringing into your gardens, even if it's a small water feature, um, that's something to be mindful of too. Now, Arthur, you tell me, do I type hollyhock up here in the search bar? Yeah, try it in the search bar, that should do it. It's a, oh, Mrs. Duke is on. Very cool. She was so tickled when um, I. she said, I saw his, he was presenting and I had him in school. Yep, she was my first grade teacher <laughs> and we've, we've maintained contact all these years. And she came to my high school graduation reception and uh, she was my favorite teacher. I will note um, she had a very big effect on my life. So it's good to see her here. She taught our flowers portion. She is just yep. a wealth of informa um, information and flowers. So Certainly you two are it. just two peas. I know it's pretty cool that, that uh, we share that, but she's probably a lot more knowledgeable than I am <laughs> in flowers. But, uh, it's so I'm, I'm getting zero results from my area. I don't know what that means. Let's see if on my end if I might be able to. I'll try it on, on this. And CT asks about Native Haven Gardens in Carnesville. And Mary has told me that she did have luck um, sourcing plants from them. I mean, I would say as a general rule, um, you know, hollyhocks, I think, are a good addition to, to a cottage garden for sure. Um, I'm partial to them. Um, so yeah, I can't get it to pull up on, on my end either on the site. And Chuck says they're native to Asia and Europe. So that's why we wouldn't see them on the native plant site. Yeah, that's why we wouldn't see them. That's it. And um, another good point to mention about how to find local native plants several organizations will have plant sales like the potomac valley audubon society um, in a normal year our master gardeners will have um, plant sales as well typically vegetable plants but sometimes folks will propagate native plants and have for sale so that's a great opportunity to support a local organization and find some native plants too that's a good point to make too. All right, we have had some excellent discussion on tonight's session. So thank you all for, uh, as always, your level of engagement and asking the really great questions that, that get to the root really of what question. you're seeing in your own backyards.
Um, but if there's no others, we'll go ahead and log off the meeting. Um, we got one more next week, critter control. That should be really popular. So I know the weather's getting warm and we all want to be outside. But if you can't catch us live next week, um, we'll have the recordings available. So thank you, um, Arthur, for your vast wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate you taking the time to share with us this evening. I appreciate the opportunity to, to present. And I enjoyed everyone's you know, questions. Very stimulating conversation. And uh, really appreciate it really enjoyed it um a couple of those questions that you had um i will that i couldn't answer i will get back to you on and maybe you can share absolutely thanks so much have a good evening everybody